David Brent is one of the most iconic sitcom characters of the 21st century. Despite only lasting two series, The Office's cultural impact has been phenomenal. And it's hard to argue that the show would have been half as successful were it not for Ricky Gervais's note-perfect performance as the ultimate boss from hell. Lazy, pathetic, classless, and having little to no care for those around him, it is easy to write Brent off as a one-note caricature, but what makes Brent such a unique comic creation is that despite coming across as insufferable, he slowly develops into something of an anti-hero, to the point that by the end of the series, we are rooting for him. In a way, David Brent is something of an inverse Walter White, starting his journey as scumbag and slowly morphing into a sympathetic character, who we as an audience can relate to. Whilst there are many ways that writer Gervais and Stephen Merchant achieve this, I think a short line from the first episode may be the best way of summarising the person David is, while simultaneously showing us the person he believes himself to be. I suppose I've created an atmosphere where I'm a friend first and a boss second probably an entertainer third. This line provides an interesting framework through which to deconstruct Brent's character, and across this video I'm going to break down these three assertions, showing you how as the show progresses they are torn apart, before being restored in the Christmas special finale. So let's start as David does, with the friend. It is clear from the outset that despite his vain assertion that he is well liked amongst his staff, David Brent is a man who has little understanding or care for those around him. David is rude, terrible at reading people, and constantly puts his own self-interest above the needs of others. Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant waste no time establishing this in the show's first episode in which Brent's practical joke, pretending to fire Dawn for stealing some post-it notes, blows up in his face and he reduces her to tears. It is not clear what David's actual intentions were in this scene, or how far he would have taken the joke had Dawn not responded immediately, but I don't think it's the case that Brent is deliberately malicious. Rather, he genuinely believes that Dawn will find this prank funny and thus consider him a friend. David is just so bad at reading people that he genuinely thinks this is a way to make him well liked around the office. However, to generalise David's actions across the series as simple misunderstandings would be a gross generalisation as it is clear that he also has a nasty streak, which feeds into his interactions with his subordinates. In particular, his treatment of Gareth shows that he is not beyond belittling those who are close to him in an effort to make himself appear superior. Just count the number of times that Brent corrects Gareth's claim that he is the assistant manager of the Slough branch. Whilst Gareth is technically incorrect in this fact, David has nothing to gain from making his correction beyond belittling Gareth in front of others. That Gareth is probably the closest thing David has to a friend in the office makes this considerably worse, but part of this may be because it is clear that David Brent doesn't really understand what friendship is. This is most evident in his interactions with Chris Finch, a bloody good rep. Just look at how Brent describes Finch here. To be honest, I think you're mad to let me and Finch on the bleeding telly. <laughs> <laughs> We're like Morecambe and Wise. Compared with how their relationship actually plays out. Despite Brent considering Finch one of his best friends, Finchy seems to delight in tormenting Brent. Oh, here we go. Fast your seatbelt. Hey, it's not a seatbelt big enough for you, you fat bastard. All bought and paid for, innit? Whether it be cracking jokes about his weight, calling him stupid, or taking abject pleasure in humiliating him whilst the cameras are rolling. Brent's behaviour often alters around Finch, and he is quick to retroactively change his opinions if he believes that it will carry favour, such as when David calls out Tim for making a pornographic caricature before retconning and declaring it hilarious after he discovers it was made by Finch. Oh, and also, him and Finch do this. <laughs> it is no wonder then that if this is his conception of what friendship is, that David routinely fails to recognise that he is not considered a friend to any of his staff. However, this all changes when the Slough branch is merged with the Swindon lot, the bloody slugs. As I established at the beginning of this essay, however, David's delusional self-assessment, a friend first, boss second, entertainer third, is shattered in the show's second season, to a point that by the end we begin to feel a lot of sympathy towards him. From the offset, it is apparent that the Swindon lot view David Brent in utter contempt and express animosity towards him in a far more vocal way than the employees of the Slough branch. This carries over into episode 2, where, during a day of appraisals, Brent attempts to extend an olive branch to his new team. But this has limited impact. It is not clear, however, that Brent's facade of being a friend is slowly slipping until later in the episode, in which he asks his new staff to go for a drink with him, a scene which dismantles his ego entirely. After taking them to the pub, David attempts to make casual conversation with the team, but they just don't bite, leading to an afternoon of incredibly stilted conversation like this. If you want a really good pie, the gardeners. 
This culminates when an exacerbated Brent declares the event a washout and tells his new staff to return to work. A scene like this presents David in a much more positive light than in Series 1. Whereas in Series 1 Brent showed little care for his staff, here he is genuinely trying to get on with his new team and forge some friendships. The fact that he is met with stern silence flips the script on the David from the previous season. Here he is character overcoming an obstacle, whereas before he was the obstacle, the antagonist who made his staff's lives hell. This is not the case in the pub scene, it is David who pushes the conversation, it is David who tries and fails, and because of this failure it is the Swindon lot that appears as an oppositional force. They misunderstand the character that we have come to know across the previous season. Much of our empathy is derived from David's intense jealousy over Neil, his Swindon counterpart. I will delve into Neil's relationship with David further when I discuss David's role as a boss, but Neil's effort to impress the Slough branch follows the exact opposite trajectory to David's. Neil is able to win over the Slough branch with ease, he is effortless in his charm, and the team seems to like him almost immediately. This leads David to becoming intensely jealous, culminating in this scene. Oh, love me. Pathetic. Here David is lashing out like a child, but we can relate to it. He has just spent an agonising lunch trying to salvage a relationship with his new team. In that time Neil has been having a laugh with the Slough branch, he's doing the very thing that David has tried to do with minimal effort. We have all been in situations like this and it resonates. Whilst David's outburst is immature, we recognise why it is happening, and this is in total contrast to some of his more childish impulses in the show's earlier episodes. We empathise with his plight because we have all tried and failed to make friends with someone, or get along with our colleagues. David's jealousy carries through into the iconic dance scene, where he turns a charity event into a literal popularity contest, which he of course loses. Defeated by the more popular Neil, it is clear that David's delusion that he is a friend to his staff has been shattered. He recognises that he is not as popular as Neil, and we feel for him. Which brings me to David's second delusion, the boss. Within minutes of the first episode we know that David is a terrible boss and across the first series we see him live up to this image time and time again. He shows favouritism towards certain employees, derails an important training exercise for the sake of his own ego, and takes on more staff even when he is told to make cutbacks, potentially jeopardising even more jobs. And yet David Brent routinely extols how great a manager he is. In his own eyes every move he does is justified and every mistake is a means of raising morality morale, or a long-term strategy that the rest of the organisation simply failed to understand. This culminates in the Series 1 finale where Brent is offered a more senior role within Wernham Hogg, which he accepts, even though it means all his staff will be made redundant. When Brent fails to get the job due to a high blood pressure, he retcons the entire event, recasting himself as a hero who in fact faked medical results for the good of his staff. The fact that he seems to genuinely believe this delusion is even more shocking, and it's clear that whilst Brent is keen to present himself as a man who is respected highly by his staff, he is really an egomaniac. In many ways, it is not the case that Brent is totally incompetent, rather that his personality is not conducive with the role he is required to do. There are easy parallels to draw between David and Tim, and it is arguable that Tim represents the David that used to be liked by his colleagues. Both of them play practical jokes, both of them have a crude sense of humour, and both of them routinely fail to take their work seriously. Except Brent is the boss, and he should know better. He has to act differently, but he's incapable of doing so. As I said earlier, a big part of what causes David's ego to shatter in the show's second season is the arrival of Neil. He represents the antithesis of Brent. He is a good boss who is well respected within the organisation, he's well liked by his staff, and for the most part, comes across as a genuinely nice person. And yet, he is also the villain. He presents a tangible threat to David Brent and the characters we have come to know, and it is his presence which ultimately leads to the collapse of Brent's ego, soliciting our sympathy as he becomes a broken man. As Gervais stated in a 2007 interview, Neil is one of two characters who we are supposed to dislike, the other being Chris Finch, and Neil's role as an antagonist is best summed up by Todd Vanderwerf, who states that Neil's a good guy and a terrific boss, but we also know he's a threat to the guys we already know, so he becomes, in his own way, the bad guy. In many ways, Neil doesn't do anything particularly unpleasant, but his presence allows us to empathise with Brent because David becomes the underdog. Neil is better at his job than David, and it is Neil who becomes the catalyst by which Brent ultimately loses his position as a boss. This all culminates in what is probably the rawest performance Gervais gives across the whole series. Please don't make redundant. Look at this man. He is completely broken. He has lost his job, the respect of his staff, 
and because of this, his identity. In showing us David at his most vulnerable, Gervais and Merchant also show him at his most human, and we can't help but view him as a sympathetic person. He has lost everything that mattered to him, and despite his efforts to cling on to it, he is powerless. We pity this man, we want him to triumph, but it is too late. His trajectory is straight out of a Greek tragedy. He was afflicted by hubris, and it became his downfall. Which leads us to the final delusion, the entertainer. Okay, so let's state the obvious right here, right now. David Brent is not a funny man. Sure, we can laugh at him, but when are we ever laughing with him? Most of his jokes consist of stolen bits from British sitcoms, and they're not even well delivered. When he's not doing this, he's either putting off ill-advised pranks like the one I mentioned earlier on Dawn, or he's offending some particular minority. Brent's comedic ineptitude is epitomised by his description of his relationship with Chris Finch. Because there's, there's no straight man, so there's no dead wood. So, uh... This is a man who literally ignores one of the basic principles of a comedic pairing, and yet believes himself to be a genuine comedian. Comedy is a huge part of David's identity. He constantly makes jokes around the office, claims to have invented many iconic catchphrases, and lists his three geniuses as Milligan, Cleese, Everett, Sessions. In many ways, he's a lot like Robert De Niro's character in The King of Comedy. He's passionate about what he wants to do, but he doesn't put the time in to honing his craft. Like his other delusions, the second season sees this delusion shattered, but this one is more instantaneous as it occurs in the first episode. Tasked with writing a speech, David sees this as an opportunity to perform a stand-up comedy routine, which goes down, yeah, pretty much as you'd expect. That Neil gives a well-received speech moments before him only adds insult to injury, and David's comedic ambitions are further destroyed after he tells a racist joke which lands him in hot water with both his staff and his boss, Jennifer. Following this, David's joke count is down considerably in series 2, as he concentrates on preserving the other two aspects of his identity, a friend and a boss, and it is somewhat ironic that he is fired on the comic relief episode of the series, a day that should have been a clear unification of David's three identities, is instead the day when each delusion is utterly shattered. However. This is not the end of Brent's journey, and with the Christmas special, Gervais and Merchant pull one final trick in their quest to transition Brent from an antagonist to a tragic anti-hero. The Christmas special deals David several low blows. He's reduced to being a travelling salesman, he is forced to confront his fears of being alone, and most horribly of all, he tries and fails to carve out a career as a Z-list celebrity. But the special isn't content to have us revel in Brent's misfortune, and instead works towards offering David a catharsis of sorts in the special's final location, the office Christmas party. Through meeting Carol, he learns what a real relationship could be like, and thus opens himself up. This exposes him to the kind of relationship or friendship that he craved from his staff, but could never quite understand. This is doubled down upon when Brent finally stands up to Chris Finch. Chris, <laughs> yeah. why don't you fuck off? What a satisfying moment. Here he finally relinquishes the hollow substitute he had for a friendship with Finch. He has experienced something more authentic and realises that he is better off without him and his approval. Likewise, David is able to reclaim his identity as a boss, albeit in a way he didn't anticipate. Whilst in conversation with Carol, he laments that his attempts to become a celebrity are humiliating, a rare moment of vulnerability, but Carol manages to turn this around. You're getting paid. You never see them again, what do you care? Yeah, take the money and run. This gives David a rare epiphany. He can be his own boss, find satisfaction in what he does, and take control of his own destiny. It doesn't matter that he hasn't got it all figured out yet, and it's okay to be vulnerable. And of course, there is the very last scene where we finally laugh with David Brent. He manages to achieve his goal of being an entertainer, albeit in a very small way. He finally makes his team laugh. Having a bit of trouble here. Oh, I'm having a bit of trouble myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, Brent's trajectory across the series comes full circle. Whilst his claim in the first episode came across as desperate, a complete delusion, as we see this imagined self get beaten into a bloody pulp by the series' conclusion, we are rooting for him. We want his false reality to be true. As John York noted, no show more ruthlessly exploited the gap between who we are and who we want to be more than The Office. And it is this tension that ultimately drives Brent's trajectory. He wants to be something he isn't. And in a way, doesn't that make him just like everyone else? You could say there's a bit of Brent in all of us. <laughs> well, I mean, 
not me, obviously, because I'm uh, an entertainer, obviously, because you're you're watching me, and um, I'm also a boss too, because I uh, I tell Chris what to do, and uh, I'm also his friend. So yeah, I'm actually all three, and uh, yeah, you should be pretty impressed. I would be. I would be. Um... <laughs> Full Fat Videos is going to strange new places. Full Fat Videos just got upgraded. And along with that, we're upgrading our Patreon with new tiers and rewards just for you. We don't unfortunately monetize most of the videos on the channel because it has copyright content. So something like Patreon could really, really help us make Full Fat Videos self-sustaining and it will allow us to make better videos and better content for you. For just $1 a month, you'd be helping us out a great deal already, which is why we thank you at the end of every video. Not to mention you'd get exclusive access to Full Fat Milk Posting, a Facebook group where you can talk to us about movies, TV and games, as well as some memes. We like a bit of memes. For $3, you'll get access to everything from the previous tiers, but you'll also get the chance to watch our videos one day early, as well as get access to exclusive scripts and bloopers. For just $5 a month, you'll get access to everything from all the other tiers, as well as exclusive access to ask the questions for our monthly Q&As. And that's not all. For just $10, you'll get access to all of the above, as well as an exclusive commentary track picked by you. For $100, I mean, you'd, you'd be keeping the lights on, so we'd really appreciate it, and we'd probably thank you at the end of every video on, on camera. You'd be really helping us in any way, shape or form if you could consider contributing to our Patreon. We love making this stuff for you guys and we'd love to keep making more of it. So thank you and thank you for watching. We're off to go make some more of that juicy content. We'll see you next time. Stay milky.